Thank you very much, His Excellency, for having us today in this fine morning. <laughs> I hope we can work together toward uh, fruitful interviews today. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for coming. And uh, it's a good pleasure to meet you. And also, thank you very much, actually, for giving me this chance uh, through you to say hello, actually, to met the audience of Medcom. Yeah. Uh, may I uh, take off my mask? Yeah, yeah, please. Okay. The relations between China and Indonesia has been established for centuries. Okay. Yeah. How do you oversee the bilateral relation between our countries? Uh, actually, basically, the bilateral relationship between China and uh, Indonesia is in good shape. So actually, it's not only a great honor, but also a great pleasure for me to serve as China's ambassador to Indonesia. Uh, if you look back to the past couple of years, you can see that actually this relationship has been developed on almost all fronts. You could see the very frequent exchanges at various levels, especially at the top level between our two countries. And you could also see the rapid increase in the trade volume and the exchanges between people to people between our two countries. But uh, I have to say that we might have to look at this bilateral relationship, not only for our two countries per se, but maybe in a broader context. For example, China and Indonesia, we are both very important developing countries. So this bilateral relationship could set a good model for the close coordination and the cooperation between developing countries. And Indonesia is a very important ASEAN country, is a very important neighbor of China. So this good bilateral relationship between China and Indonesia could also be part of our joint efforts to establish a community for shared future. And Indonesia is also the most populous Muslim country. You know that actually that's also could, I mean the bilateral relationship between China and Indonesia could also be a good reflection mm. of China's relationship and cooperation with the Islamic country and the Muslim countries in general. I don't know whether you are aware that actually about uh, a couple of months ago, two months ago, uh, this year for the first time the Chinese foreign minister attended the ministerial meeting of OIC. Oh. And in that meeting, he, when he addressed the meeting, actually, he initiated that China and all the Islamic countries should be partners mm. in promoting closer cooperation, in promoting more stability and uh, security, in promoting more development and uh, prosperity. And the last but not least, we should be partners in promoting mutual learning from each other and exchange of civilization. Yeah. So you know that actually, if you look at that in the bigger picture, China and the Indonesia relationship could be very important. But uh, I can tell you it's also, it could also be a very challenging for me to serve as China's ambassador here because our leaders and our peoples could be very demanding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Our countries are, uh, we can say that we are best friends for a long, long time. Yeah, yeah. 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 For centuries? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Okay, uh, the uh, next question. Uh, in your view, what has been the pinnacle of our relation? Uh, what uh, what the, the, the most highest achievement of our relation so far? Uh, as I said, uh, in general, it's in good shape. And you could see developments, very quick developments on almost all fronts. For example, at the high level, you could see the very frequent exchanges between our two presidents, mm. uh, President Xi Jinping and President Jokowi already met yeah. for about 10 times. Yeah, yeah. Okay. 10 and, times. Yeah, 10 times. And even due, in the context of COVID-19, actually, they had very frequent contact. Yeah. They had uh, very frequent contacts through telephone conversation or any other forms. And we could also see that actually the trade volume between China and Indonesia increased very much. Oh. And uh, I think uh, China has been uh, Indonesia's biggest trade partner in the past nine consecutive years. Consecutive? Yeah. And uh, in the past six consecutive years, China has been the number one destination for Indonesia's exports. And for the past three years, China has been the number three investor, biggest investor in Indonesia. So you could see the this kind of rapid progress that has already benefited our two peoples. 
But、uh, another thing I have to stress is that sometimes even difficulties and challenges could become opportunities for enhancing our bilateral relationship. So that reflects actually the resilience of this bilateral relationship. For example, when COVID-19 comes came, nobody know what it was,、mm. but you could see the very quick mutual assistance. Between our two countries, between our two peoples, and actually, that our joint efforts in combating, in dealing with COVID-19, has been a big plus in our bilateral relationship. So actually, we're proud of that. But we know that there are still great potentials for us to work together to cultivate. Yeah. Okay. Okay.、Uh, so our trade volume、uh, increasing significantly. Yeah, during the pandemic, right? Even during the pandemic,、oh. last year, actually, according to the stats、mm. from the from the Indonesia government, it's already around 110、yeah. billion.、Mm. According to our stats,、mm. it's already 120 billion something. 120. <laughs> yeah. Okay.、Uh, next question.、Uh, both both China and Indonesia are very active in the international community. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, in this geo geopolitical situation, which、uh, changes rapidly.、Uh, How do China anticipate something like that? Anticipate the geo geopolitical <coughs> example,、uh, the Russian-Ukraine crisis. Yeah,、uh, actually, we still believe that、uh, the pursuit for peace and prosperity that's、mm. still the common goal、mm. for all peoples around the world. But you are absolutely right. There are something we we are supposed to worry about in today's world. First, there are always efforts. You can always see efforts every now and then, every here and there, try to intensify the contradictions around the world. There are even practices try to engage in block confrontation, in camp、uh, confrontation. So this kind of practice actually add to the tension,、mm. add to the difficulties、mm. of today's world. And you could also see, actually, the irresponsible policies by some governments in their macro policies、mm. that has already caused turbulences around the world, around the world market, especially ramifications. You could like look at the ramifications actually for the developing countries. What worries us even more is that there is a tendency these days that some countries would like to change the rules of game. For example, you could always hear some countries these years, they would cry for what they term as, what they call as, the rules-based international order.、Mm. So when you ask those governments what kind of rules, how do we define the rules, rules, they will never give you a very explicit answer. According to our views, when you say the international rules, it should be the rules that's universally、mm. accepted by the world. By all the countries, countries around the world, so in our view, that should be the United Nations Charter.、Mm. But when you ask those countries whether, you, when you say the rules, whether you refer to the United Nations Charter, they will never give you a definite yes on that. So this this is a kind of tendency, very dangerous tendency, that all countries should be very vigilant on. So in this kind of complicated situation, China and Indonesia. As we are both important countries, important members of the international community, especially we are important developing countries, we have our responsibility that to preserve the charter or the principles and purposes of the Charter of the United Nations, and to safeguard the common interests of the developing countries. So we have a lot to do. Yeah, we are. But.、Well, Then、into the next question.、Yeah. Okay.、Uh, as the new ambassador to Jakarta,、uh, what kind of form of diplomacy do you think、uh, the most suitable to improve our relationship?、Uh, there are a lot to do. As I told you, <laughs> the job could be very challenging and demanding.、Uh, but basically, there are three areas that、mm -hmm. I would focus on.、Uh, first, actually, to promote even further、uh, the close ties, the close bonds.、Mm -hmm. Between our two countries, especially in economic, trade, investment area, and 
actually we should try to accomplish in high quality and in good time the <coughs> those joint ventures on the great projects and we have to bring about more tangible results accomplishments to the public that could benefit the public the second area the second dimension could that I would like to actually to help more enhance the mutual understanding mutual knowledge and mutual understanding of our two peoples mm. it's always very important actually to strengthen the people to people exchanges mm. that could lay a sound basis actually to a bilateral relationship and the third dimension we always have to keep, keep in mind that China and Indonesia were very important players in today's international arena yes. so we have to work together on all those multilateral fora to, advoca to advocate those important agendas mm -hmm. for the developing world this year Indonesia is going to host the G20 yeah, yeah. it's a big event yeah. it's a big event not only for Indonesia I told my Indonesia colleagues it's also a big event for China for Asian countries for developing countries and in today's world it's also very important a successful G20 summit would be equally important for all the countries in today's world okay okay since you're mentioning the G20 uh, uh, what do you think about the <coughs> Indonesian presidency so far uh, the the leadership Indonesia has shown to the world so far what do you think about that my colleagues in the, in the Indonesian government, they have worked very hard. I can. <laughs> Yesterday, I was in uh, Foreign Minister Retno's office. We had a good chat. Uh, one of the topics was on G20. Mm. Uh, that I appreciate very much, actually, how hard our Indonesian colleagues have worked on, mm. especially in this, uh, at this difficult juncture. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. We have a lot of issues yeah. that they have to deal with. And especially, there are always forces try to complicate the agenda, mm. the focus of this year's G20 agenda. So we appreciate that, but not only appreciate, we have already offered to our Indonesian colleagues that China will work together with our Indonesian colleagues to make this year's G20 a big success. Okay, uh, about that that juncture, complicate things. <laughs> what do you think about uh, Indonesian decision to invite Ukraine and Russia at the same time? What do you think about that? Uh, I think from the very beginning, we told, uh, there are two sentences. I told uh, my Indonesian colleagues. Uh, it's true that some people would like to introduce other topics. Topics uh, basically or by nature outside the very nature of G20. G20 is a platform for economic and financial issues. But uh, you have already seen the efforts or attempts by some other countries yes. to introduce in something irrelevant in our view uh, to the G20 topic. But so far, Indonesia has been very persistent in its principled position that this forum should be focused on what it is supposed to be. Uh, secondly, <coughs> I told my Indonesian colleague that China will always back up our Indonesian colleague in hosting a successful G20 summit. There are a lot of issues we have to deal with. Many countries are already in some financial or economic difficulties. So we need <coughs> more coordination by economists, especially major economists, to coordinate their macro policies to help the recovery to help a sustainable recovery from all countries. So you know that when Indonesia government insists that Russia should be invited on G20, they are right. It's a correct, it's a correct decision. China supports that. And definitely, we also told our initial colleague that we will be with them, not try to make the topics more diverted away mm. from its nature yeah. but focused on the economy yeah um, 
China took a strong stance toward the West, especially the United States about the U <laughs> Ukraine, uh, Russia crisis. Uh, what makes China took that stance? So when you say China took a strong stance towards the West, the yeah. United States, it was your estimation or? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I can tell you that China never tried to categorize countries mm. according to the difference in ideology or whatever values that some people would like to say, we actually make our own judgment and take our own policies and approaches based on basically facts mm -hmm. and the principles. When I talked to Foreign Minister Retino yesterday, she iterated that, reiterated that Indonesia's foreign policy is rules-based, principle-based, and principle oriented. Mm. I highly appreciate that. That's also the case with China. So we are against not a group of countries or a certain country. We are against some wrong practices mm. or wrong attempts by some countries in today's world. For example, some countries these days, they would like to intensify the contradictions they engage themselves in block confrontation and camp politics. That has brought about not only difficulties, but sometimes disasters for people, for countries around the world. If you look back to the past decades, after the end of the Cold War, you could see how many wars have been evoked among other countries. By the way, many of them are Islamic countries are Muslim countries. So it's just immoral to pursue this kind of geopolitics at the cost of the casualties of innocent civilians around the world. China is against that. China definitely will take, we have already taken, but definitely we will continue to take strong stance against those wrong practices. Also, we are against some of the practice try to smear other countries. Uh, yeah. So you're yeah, not unfamiliar with that. I don't want to repeat. <laughs> yeah, okay, thank you very much for the answer. Okay, the next crisis, uh, uh, still regarding uh, the G20. Mm -hmm. uh, many, many countries, especially the West, uh, are refused to engage with Russia in Bali uh, this, this November. Uh, what do you think about that? Uh, the, the, the boycott, <laughs> something like that. I, I don't want to sit together with Russia. We can be business as usual. <laughs> Many countries in the West said that. What, what would, do China feel about that? In what position do they believe that, uh, that, that, that they are in a position to, <laughs> yeah. to, 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 to expel Russia? Mm. Uh, they, they don't want to be in the same room in the G20 summit. First, G20, as I said, mm. G20 is a platform for discussion among major economies mm. on coordination of macro policies. So, in today's world, we might have challenges mm. every now and mm. then, every here and there. In their logic, should there be anything coming up, should mm. there be any incident, then we should complicate the agenda or the focus of G20? Mm. I don't think that's the case. Secondly, all members of G20 are equal members. Nobody is in a better or higher position than yeah. anyone else mm. to try to expel the others. If that's the case, let's just count. After the end of the Cold War, how many wars were waged against other countries? Especially some wars were against without the authorization of the Security Council of the United Nations. Mm. So those who wage those wars, should they also be expelled from all the multilateral forum? Those are the questions that those countries should ask themselves. Uh, re regarding the South China Sea, uh, are mm. you okay with that? Okay. Is there any progress in upholding a peaceful, peaceful way to solve the problem between China and the climate countries? Mm -hmm. uh, South China Sea? Yeah. 
I think that's the wish not only for China, but for all the countries neighboring South China Sea. We would like to make it a sea of peace, a sea of prosperity, mm. a, pe a, a sea of unity. Mm. This year actually marked the 20th anniversary of DOC. And now, under, under this framework, I think basically countries in this region, I mean China and the ASEAN countries, basically, we have managed in maintaining the peace and the security and the stability in this region. And basically, countries that have different claims or have some disputes, yeah, dispute. over whether it's the territorial or the jurisdictional issues, basically, they could set aside those differences and focus on common development <coughs> for the common interests mm. of all the countries, all the peoples in this world. So I think that's the basic approach we should stick to. And it's also my understanding that China and ASEAN countries were also intensifying mm -hmm. the discussion or negotiation on DOC, on COC, sorry, on COC. on COC. That could provide a sound basis for countries in this region to manage the relationship, mm -hmm. uh, to handle some of the differences. So you know that that's basically the common wish of countries in this region. We benefit from that, from this kind of cooperation. That serves the interests, mm -hmm. not only people in this region, but actually for the world at large. Mm -hmm. And we hope countries outside this region, they should respect that. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, thank you. Next question uh, about the Belt and Road Initiative. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, that initiative is the one of the highlights of our relationship, China yeah, and Indonesia. Yeah. Uh, uh, could you describe uh, what China and Indonesia can get from the, this initiative? Uh, we have already got a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Can you mention <coughs> any uh, of that? I've already said the examples mm -hmm. of the trade volume, mm -hmm. especially the rapid increase mm -hmm. of the trade volume. Mm -hmm. And also you could look at those joint projects mm -hmm. Uh, between China and uh, Indonesia. Many projects. Right? Many projects. Actually, I went to visit the Jakarta Bandung oh, uh, high, speed, high, speed high speed railway. Mm -hmm. Not only that will facilitate actually the flow of goods and the people, mm -hmm. uh, that would facilitate actually the economic growth, but you know that actually that also creates jobs. Mm, yeah, a lot of jobs. I learned that <coughs> during that visit, I learned that just that 142 kilometers, mm -hmm. after the accomplishment of the project, that will create more than 5,000 jobs mm. along the line. Along the line. Along the line. Mm -hmm. Not to mention, there are many other uh, <laughs> ramifications. Yeah. So those are the tangible results that uh, could benefit our two peoples. But another thing, almost uh, the same importance is, you know that in the cooperation to build or for our cooperation under the Belt and Road Initiative, we have already come up with this good practice that two developing countries, two partners, two Belt and Road Initiative, we could discuss together, we could work together, and we so benefit together. So that's why it's already about nine years ever since the Belt and Road Initiative was tabled. It has become more and more attractive. Today, around the world, there are more than 140 or around 150 countries and some 30 international organizations already been part of to this Belt and Road okay. Initiative. Okay, the next question uh, regarding COVID-19. Uh, the, the Shanghai city uh, aims to return to normal life uh, from the June 1st next month. Uh, how is the current situation in Shanghai this day? Is China optimistic that target will be achieved? That target will be achieved? Uh, if you look at Shanghai, the situation in Shanghai is getting better, I can yeah, tell you. Yeah. But you know that actually, although it's already been more than two years mm. 
ever since the outbreak of COVID-19. No scientists, no medical experts is 100% clear yeah. about the very nature. It's still a mystery. <laughs> it's still a mystery. So there are always chances that that could still cause casualties of people's lives. Different countries, different governments have carried out different approaches mm. in dealing with. Uh, there are always some pros and cons. Yeah. There are always some efforts try to balance, yeah. on the one hand, how to manage or control mm. the pandemic. Mm. On the other hand, how to try to minimize, mm. actually, the costs to the economic and the social life. That's also the way the Chinese government is pursuing. For the Chinese government, we always put at the highest priority people's life. Yeah. So that's why the policy in China has been people-oriented. That's it. And that has been effective if you look at, if you look at the situation in China. Mm. We, we try our best to minimize, actually, people, the casualty mm. from this COVID-19. At the same time, we are also looking at good practice around the world and try to make our policies in continuing the pandemic be more targeted mm -hmm. on scientific analysis. In this way, try to also to minimize the costs to the social and economic life. Okay. The North Korea is also battling the COVID-19 recently. Uh, has China provided assistance to the North Korea? Of course we do. Yeah. We do. Okay. Yeah, actually, you know that uh, uh, we provide assistance not mm -hmm. only to DPRK, mm -hmm. but to many other countries, mm -hmm. especially our neighboring countries, including Indonesia. Yeah, yeah, we yeah. help each other a lot. Yeah. Uh, we believe that actually this is something that all countries should work together to deal with. We should help each other. Mm -hmm. We should not let alone any country, any individual. Okay, okay. Uh, about the most recent issue, uh, today uh, the, the, Quad, the Quad Nation is <laughs> yeah, <laughs> are meeting in Tokyo. Uh, they say they want to, to meet to, uh, to counter the China influence in the region. <laughs> what do you say about that? Uh, actually, we've already talked about that. Mm -hmm. You know that in this region, for Asia and the Pacific, I think most of the countries, including China mm -hmm. and Indonesia, we cherish the peace, stability, and we still would like to continue to focus on mm -hmm. the joint development for the prosperity and the benefits of all the countries and all the people in this region. Mm -hmm. But it's also a matter of fact. You can always see attempts from outside, from some governments. They would like to make issues in this region. They would like to create tension in this region. They would like to create confrontation in this region. And by doing that, they would like to try to divert, divert the focus of countries in this region mm. from economic development, from more cooperation in benefiting our, two peop our peoples. Actually, that does not serve our interests. And it's for countries or governments in this region to be alert on that. Okay. Uh, regarding Tokyo and Japan, uh, there's uh, some kind of okay, calls to reform the, the UN, mm -hmm. the <laughs> Security Council. Yeah, uh, yeah. Japan wants to, to become a permanent member mm. of, uh, and <coughs> the United States seems to, to supporting that idea. Uh, what do you think about that? China has always been a strong advocate for the reform of the United mm. Nations, including its Security Council. Ah, yeah. But we always have to bear in mind what's the purpose mm. for the reform. In our view, the Security Council or the United Nations, for years, it does not reflect the reality that we have already a great increase 
of the number of developing countries in this United Nations yeah, yeah. organ. Mm. So the very purpose, in our view, is any reform should reflect the, reflected, the, the reality that there are more developing countries now. Mm. So we should increase the representation mm. of developing countries, whether in the Security Council or in other organs of the United Nations. Any reform should not be or is not supposed to be just to serve the interests of a group or handful of countries for their own interests. That's not the purpose. And for any responsible government or responsible member of the United Nations, when they make their decisions on the reform, when they design their policies on the reform of the United Nations, especially the Security Council, they should bear in mind that this is an issue for the interests of the vast majority of all the members of the United Nations. It should not be politicized for any single government's geopolitical agenda. Okay, okay. So uh, uh, about the, the reform, the most pressing issue, the most important issue is about the veto. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, they want to do the, U.S. want to do the reform the, to increase the, I don't know, representation of the region. They said that, what do you think about the veto? It, it, uh, it's, okay. it's been causing some disturbance. What do you think about that, the, the, the veto? Uh, actually, you have to look back mm. to the structure of the Security Council mm. and the voting power mm. of the Security Council in the United Nations, where it was originated. There was a reason for how it came to be. Mm. And it's fully understandable. It's fully understandable that there are members of the United Nations that have some concern mm over the abuse the of veto, of mm. the veto power mm. that happened, especially during the Cold War years. Mm. So if you look at actually all those proposals already tabled in the United Nations concerning the reform of the Security Council mm. or the United Nations as a whole, you could see that there are a lot of categories of issues interrelated mm -hmm. <laughs> to each other. Yeah. How you could accommodate the interests of the vast majority mm -hmm. of the members of the United Nations, mm -hmm. you have to combine them together instead of just a singling out one part or another part that might serve only part or even a handful of members, mm. because they have their own priorities, they have their own politics. So if things are taken apart separately and dealt with separately, definitely that will ruin the whole process of the reform of the United Nations as a whole. Okay, I think that's it, His Excellency. <laughs> Thank you very much for this interview. Thank you very much. Yeah, Thank you. Good, good to talk to you. Bye-bye. Yeah. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.